All right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, first off, what I want to do is uh, just take kind of a roll call. We invited uh, many classes of students here today. Um, those taking object oriented, 2102. Those taking object oriented for non majors, 220X, I believe. And also people taking soft edge. Um, so, really, what we want to try to do is lecture mostly on the majority, but also cover stuff so anyone here can get something out of it. So, if you could please, um, if you're in object oriented for CS majors, that is the uh, 2102 class, could you please raise your hand? All right, so we expected that this would be the most of the majority of the class. Um, you guys have had two lectures so far. For the most part, you've probably been using Dr. Java in class, and it is much simpler. So um, what we're going to try to do in this is uh, get you guys over that first learning curve to hopefully get you some more of the features and things like that that Eclipse has. Um, so do we have anyone here who is in the uh, CS object-oriented course for non-majors? If you could raise your hand. So, yeah, again, we're just going over Eclipse, so most of this stuff should cover for you guys. If you have to use Eclipse for your class and you can't use Docker Java, we should be giving you the tools you'll need to install, run, and uh, write Java code in Eclipse. And uh, the kind of oddball out on this one may be the uh, soft engine group. Do we have anyone here from software engineering? All right, so we have a few people. Um, if we could actually uh, get a hand raise, how many of you guys have used Eclipse before? Okay. Um, so this may be a little bit too much of an intro for you guys. Um, I guess uh, let me ask you guys see if we can cover some things within here, get into like some specific details while we're going through. Was there certain stuff you guys were looking for to get out of this other than just how to basically use Eclipse? Like, is there certain plugins that you guys need for the course and stuff like that? How do I use JUnit? Okay, so um, I was hoping to have time to cover JUnit. Technically, 2102 will be using it later. Um, but yes, I will try to get into that if I can. If not, we do plan on hopefully having another lecture specifically for JUnit because testing is very important. Um, anyone else have something specific? Yes? Okay. Um, Probably not going to cover that here, I apologize. Um, if you want to direct either to some of your TAs for the class, and also Stack Overflow has an entire ant tag, and they usually have a good um, tutorial about setting up ant builds and things like that. Um, very proactive <laughs> for setting up ant. Um, if you can get that working well, it'll definitely keep things nice and clean. Um, anything else specific from your soft engine guys? Yeah. Oh, uh, not soft oh, Okay, but yeah. Um, Yeah, so one of the big things we want to set up here is uh, for you in 2102, which is the majority here, you guys have to use the tester jar, which is pretty much the hardest thing compared to Dr. Java to set up, and uh, we're going to have a section on that. Um, anything else specific? Okay, all right, so let's head right into it. Um, so first thing you need to do in order to get uh, working with Eclipse is actually download it. So some of you guys may have found your way to the Eclipse website. This is just the Downloads tab on their website. And you may have uh, come here and found that, oh wow, um, there's Eclipse Standard, but then there's all of these guys. Which one do I choose? Oh my god. Um, so really, what Eclipse is, or what it's become anyway, is kind of a framework for developing Java code, and even at this point, just a framework for developing code. So a lot of these extra package solutions um, have some additional features or made for other programming languages. Uh, let's for say the uh, C and C++ developers uh, Eclipse is literally just a perspective for um, writing C code and you actually can't write Java code in it unless you install another plugin. For most of you guys here, if you're doing Java code, um, all you guys are going to need is the Eclipse standard version. and. Uh, there's a Windows 32 and 64-bit. If you're using a Mac, you'll probably also have the same option. I recommend just going with the 32-bit. You're not going to get much out of using a 64-bit version, and there's sometimes some weird operating system quirks with that. So 32-bit works just fine. And Eclipse Standard comes with everything you need to develop Java code, run it, and um, since Kepler started, they actually installed uh, plugins like Eclipse Git and Eclipse uh, CVS and maybe uh, Subversion for Eclipse. So for you guys in soft ends, you already have the plugin installed for getting at um, Git repositories or SVN repositories. All right, so um, downloading a file takes a while. So um, assuming that you have downloaded the file, which should just be a zip file to your computer, 
um, it should look something like this. Um, so Eclipse is not like many of the programs you guys use today where you have some installer, you have to click next, 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 agree to things that you never even read, and then install it. Um, most of the stuff, um, you know, how Eclipse works is it's literally just a folder and you run the application within the folder. There's nothing that you have to install, it just does its thing within the folder and wherever your workspace is. So as far as that goes, to install Eclipse, all you have to do is, you know, use 7-zip or uh, Windows, the unarchive utility, unzip the folder wherever you would like. Um, I recommend putting the Eclipse folder that pops up, um, usually in a place where you would put your programs, so like program files or something like that, and then you can either put a shortcut on your desktop or uh, pin it down to your taskbar like this once you've run it. Um, and pretty much that's all you need to know for the installation process. Um, the other thing is, is when you do go to run Eclipse, wherever you run it from, you will be prompted with this message first. And this is kind of the first step into, okay, this is a little bit different than just a Dr. Racket editor or something like that where I just open up a file and edit it. I actually have something called a workspace. So, so your workspace is really where all your project files are going to go. And your projects are pretty much um, either your labs, your homeworks, which are you know just little subsets of Java files that run together to form some sort of main application, or in, in most of your cases, just for running tests. Um, what I highly recommend is you can put this workspace anywhere. It is definitely a good idea to keep it outside of the, uh, the Eclipse EXE directory. So the thing that you unzipped and put somewhere and the Eclipse application is inside, keep those two things separate. Because really, if you want to uninstall Eclipse, you just delete that folder. You don't want to delete all your projects with that, and uh, it's just nice to keep them separate. What I usually do is put the Eclipse installation folder in my program files. Um, on a Mac, you could put it in like the app directory. Um, it actually may force you to do that. Um, and then, as far as uh, your workspace, I usually put it somewhere in my documents or under my user directory in a Unix-based operating system. So, you know, just in case I need to grab those projects, I can find them pretty easily. So for this, we're just going to be running a bare bones workspace so we can go through it like you've just installed it. And at this point, I will be handing it over to Nick. Okay. So when you start up Eclipse, it's going to look like this. There's a bunch of panes and windows, and it can be a little bit overwhelming at first. So most importantly, you've got your toolbar with a bunch of buttons, your menus, which have every option you can think of, um, your source code will appear here when you have it, and your projects, which contain the actual code you're going to write, are going to be over here. So you'll probably have one or more workspaces per class, and for every assignment that you do or something, you'll have its own. Pro you'll have your own project. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a project. So just like you might do in any other program, you've got file menu and new and edit and stuff like that. So I'm going to make a new project. So if you do project or Java project. Um. If you have the Java IDE, you'll be making a Java project, and that will pre-configure Eclipse to do what you want. I don't think if you have Java Eclipse, if you have Eclipse Java, I think it only gives you the Java project option, or it will be the easiest to pick anyway. Oh no, project was there, but yes, you will want to make a Java project. Can I pin this to myself? Yes. Um, okay, so I'm just going to make a project, and the rest of the settings should be fine for you at this point. But um, yeah, those should be okay. And inside your project, there will be it will pre-create all the uh, all the setups you need to all the configuration you need to be able to talk to Java and actually go ahead and run your program. Any code you create will go in in some hierarchy within the project. It basically creates a folder structure, and you can decide how to organize that. If you're in Soft Eng, this will be a big discussion with your team on how you're going to organize your code. For your for your labs, you can create a file basically anywhere you like. So in the source directory, I can create a new. I can create files, and it, it tries to automate the process by um, using these little menus. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new class, and I'm going to call that, actually I'm going to create an interface first, excuse me. That's the thing they teach you in 2102, always start with an interface. So I'm going to create the interface iFruit for the fruit class. And at this point I don't have any interfaces, I don't want to do comments. So I'm going to go ahead and let it do that for me. And you can see it made me an interface. Um, if you go ahead and do more configuration, you can have it generate the, the, uh, the big header comments or anything like that. Thank you.
So once you have the interface, you can go ahead and write your code and define all the methods that your classes should be, that the classes that implement it should be using. So do stuff. Or something like that. You can make your, you can write whatever you want. Um, but now that I have a source code window, um, I can just talk about some of the other panes. So over here is your outline. When you have a lot of methods in your code, you can see this one popped up right here. It's just going to show you all the, me all the methods that are in this file. And as you switch files, that'll change with you. Um, the console down here, once you start running your code, you will actually see some, the output of the program down here. And you can, of course, see how I've got the project tree over here. Um, I can play around with these menus as much as I like. I can minimize them. I can close them. One handy one is if you double click on this, you can make it, um, uh, you can minimize all the other panes and you can snap it right back. That's pretty useful. You can also take this and drag it to the side, or I can in mine. Come on. Maybe not. Oh, I know why. You can duplicate it, window, new editor. You can drag them to the side to side by side them. I do this a lot. Um, or do anything like that. So it, it gives you a lot of options for viewing your code. And when you have tons of files like you would in SoftEng, or even in some of your uh, later homework assignments, it, it might be useful to you. Um, let me see. After the interface, I can create a class. And you can, you can do this yourself, or you can um, fill it in from the Eclipse uh, window. So I'm going to create a class, Apple, which is going to implement iFruit, but I don't see it here. Oh, there it is. So if you start typing, it'll match your interface. And then once I create it, it already knows that it already saw the interface, and it did the basic setup for me. And it already found this method in iFruit, so it went and implemented it in my class. So that's just the basic setup. What else do I want? Yes. So that's the basic setup that'll let you write your code. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is importing and exporting. So when you go to submit your project, um, this will uh, give you a nice way to package up your code in a zip file so you can either send it to someone, send it to the graders, or just keep a backup copy um, if you want. And the good thing about this is that it will keep all of Eclipse's configuration as well as your source code. And uh, that can actually be very useful. So one way to do this is just to right click on the project, hit export, and then go to archive file. And it'll let you select what files you want. I'm just going to leave all of them selected, but you can you can be picky if you want. And then you are going, and then you can just type in a file and put it wherever you like. And then it will go and do that for you. Uh, similarly, you can I don't want to do it there. Similarly, you can import code however you would like. So we ah yes, um, I always make that mistake. You can import code however you like. So I, or uh, Ryan made us a test project, which is this guy. Yeah. Um, and it found the project in the archive file, and now it's going to import it. So here's some code that we wrote up earlier. I'm going to kill this since it's not relevant. So here's a bit of example code. Um, and once you have a lot of code, one of the great things about Eclipse is that it gives you a lot of um, opportunities to navigate your code to find out um, where stuff is and, and how it works. And when you have a lot of files, that can be really interesting. Um, so one of the first thing they have is uh, basically standard search that you might expect, and also Java search. So you can, you can uh, specify what you want to search and then tell it what kind of parameter you're looking for. So if you're looking for a variable or looking for a class or a method, or anything like that, you can uh, use these fields to find it. So if I just search something like Apple, it should tell me that I have a method that has the word Apple in it. And if you notice, this was, oh. If you notice, there's, see all the, remember all these tabs we had down here? One of them shows your search results. And um, it will hierarchically display like what files everything was in and all the results. So when you have 25,000 files, it can be pretty, pretty easy to find which ones have what you're looking for. So that can be pretty nice. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, if you decide to play around with all your tabs um, and close them and destroy them and do whatever, um, you can go in here to Window and then hit Reset.
perspective and it will realign everything exactly the way it was when it started up. So if you wind up messing with your interface, you can get it back really easily. Eclipse likes to um, create these layouts for you called perspectives and it, it associates tasks with them. If you find this, if you click on this little button right up here, you can see all the tasks that it's designed. A lot of these are defined by plugins. So uh, for you soft edge people, if you install plugins, the, it will create a perspective for them. And this is how you would switch to it to see, to actually use your plugin. Uh, what else did I miss? Oh, so after basic search, you can also, is there a method call in here? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, if you, one of the other things you can do very easily is just find out what calls a certain method. So this is a method in the class examples. Actually, that's a bad one to use because it doesn't get called anywhere, does it? Um, if I want to find out what, what uses this file, what uses this method, you can right click on the method itself and go to references. And it's gonna ask you where it wants you to search. So you can just say project. And apparently it's not called anywhere. Apple, where? I should have asked you first. References. Yes. So it's telling me that I called it in the test, which is good because you know that part of the code is tested. Sort of. Um, to actually know we would do coverage, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, let me think. So references. Another useful thing is um, instead of finding who calls it, if you have a piece of code, say your test, which I lost, examples, thank you. Um, if you have a piece of code and you want to find out something about um, the code that you're looking at, you can right click it and say open declaration and it will snap you to uh, where that method is defined. And it will pick the most specific method it can for the scope you're in. So that can be pretty useful just for finding out what code does. Um, so when you're given a piece of code, it can be easy to follow what, what you're working on and, and what's actually being used to avoid having to, you know, search through all these tabs and stuff. So that can be pretty useful. What's the other one? Autocomplete. Yes, one of the best features about Eclipse is that whenever you're typing, it will, if you pause, it will give you a list of all the things that you can possibly do for your current scope. Um, a lot of these involve Java constructs that you haven't messed with. But if I just type this and I can Notice that I have these uh, fields declared up here. I can refer to them, or if I just start typing this, it can show me that these fields exist, and I can um, and I can very easily select them. This also works for methods too. Um, so wherever wherever you are typing, you can basically um, either wait for the autocomplete prompt or type Control Space, and it will try and complete it as best it can. Um, that doesn't really make sense right now, but. Um, so autocomplete could be pretty useful for you doing, especially when you wind up typing really long method names. So no matter what file you're in, if I, yeah, this is a good one. Um, do I have an instance of a class somewhere? No. But yeah, if I were trying to access that Apple, it will, it will show me the fields and it will um, let me play around with that. So that can be pretty useful as well. Okay. Is that it? Okay, so now I'm going to turn it back to Ryan for even more fun features. All right, so we kind of went a little quickly over some of the basics of, you know, you open up Eclipse, you're editing classes and things like that. Um, would you guys like to go over any of those things in more detail? Is there anything that's confusing? Are we just boring you to death? Um, when you make a project, do you have to go into the libraries and import the tester every time? Um, so I will cover the tester right after this. Okay. Um, any questions as far as what we covered so far? Yeah. When should we use packages and when should we create the packages? Okay, so um, the reason why we didn't mention packages is most of the people here are in 2102. Um, packages are really a way to organize your code. Um, I'll cover them right now. Okay. So for 2102, most of your projects, so this is 2102 and uh, the uh, intro for non-CS majors, the 220X, most of your projects are only going to have, you know, a couple of files, like the situation we have here. Um, you know, you may have upwards of like nine files at maximum, but for the most part, you guys aren't going to be making a ton of classes per each homework. So organization doesn't really come into play that much, but if you wanted to, and also I know we have a lot of soft edge people here, um, those are the cases where you guys are really going to want to start separating out your Java uh, files, which should hopefully each have one class named after the file, 
um, so you can keep things organized when you have, you know, let's say 200 Java files floating around. Uh, hold on one second. So, um, I will get into packages right after this. Um, does anyone else have any questions before I go with that? Whoops. So, um, if there was a plugin to do that, yes. So, Eclipse is primarily a Java IDE. Um, I believe, I know that there's a very big one for writing C and C++ code, and you can either install the plugin or install the Eclipse that's preset up for that. And what you pretty much get up here is a uh, new perspective, and you'd have something for like C and C++, which would then treat your projects like it had a bunch of C files in it, and you could edit them like that. Yes, yeah. so most of the perspectives that are created, there's a couple of basic ones that Eclipse has, which would be the debugging one, Java, which is of course the default, uh, browsing, hierarchy, um, plugin development, which you guys will never go into, and stuff like this. Um, as far as plugins go, um, the Git plugin for Eclipse never used to be pre-installed, but now it is. But let's say it wasn't installed and you installed it, that's where this guy would come from, um, is the Git repository exploring perspective. Um, I believe there is actually a Python um, plugin for Eclipse, and if you installed that properly and it was in your plugins directory and it was working, um, what you would probably do is come here to opening the perspective, and there would be something about uh, Python editing. I think it's PyEdit or something like that. I haven't used it in a while, um, but once you do that um, and you go to that perspective, then when you start um, opening files within your project, they'll be treated like Python files because you're in that perspective. Um, at the end, I will try. Um, for the most part, since we have a lot of uh, 2102 students here, um, they never get into that, but I know we got some soft edge people here, so I will do my best to leave time for that at the end. Um, any other questions? Uh, if you want to dart back to Apple, that job for a sec. Okay, yeah, give me one second. All right, that should hopefully stay there. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, anything that says at override, um, there are certain situations where you will have to put that. For interfaces, it's optional, but it's always good to. Eclipse will add them by default. So um, if I didn't have this method here, and this is another thing that I'm going to go into later, is uh, Eclipse is really good at catching your mistakes, and it's very good at auto correcting them for you. So if you notice, Apple implements iFruit, but it doesn't have the method for iFruit. In Dr. Java, you would compile it and it would yell at you. In this program, um, it yells at you, but you can also hover over wherever it's yelling at you and you'll get a lot more verbose information because it kind of compiles each uh, file on the fly. So I hovered over where the red squiggly was, which is an error, um, yellow squiggles are warnings. And it says that the type apple must implement the inherited abstract method ifruit.getNum seeds. Well, okay, because I inherited that method from the interface, it's not here, so I messed up. Oh, that's really nice. It's got quick fixes for me. So I can either add the unimplemented method, which I want to do. Um, technically, you soft edge guys may want to start making abstract classes, so technically an abstract class doesn't need to implement methods. Nobody else needs to worry about that. So the thing to do would be to add the unimplemented method. Um, Eclipse, just because it likes to try to be as pretty and following standards as much as possible, it puts in that annotation for you. Annotations are pretty much anything that start with an at symbol. Um, and the places where it starts to really matter is more with abstract classes. So if you had like a shape class or something, and then like your square class overrode one of the methods that it got from its uh, um, shape um, father or in this hierarchy, um, without the override tag, it wouldn't know to actually do that. So, um, you know, if I took this out, it's not going to yell at me but it's technically good to keep it there, um, especially when you start getting a lot of code. Um, knowing that it has an override tag, you can know immediately, oh, that came from an interface or an abstract class that I have here. Any other questions? Um, when you make files in Java, it tends to add public everything when you do like, the make class. Um, Hamilton has been putting public in front of it, so it doesn't break anything, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, you guys in 2102, you should cover this in like the last week or two of class. 
um, public, private, protected, or nothing at all, it's defining scope. Sure. So if you had a big project and you know you wanted people who, like let's say you had a soft edge group here, um, actually this would be a great example. I'm going to start making packages to answer that question. So let's say I was in a soft edge group and I was making, I don't know, some sort of uh, produce function that kept track of like apples or something for a store. Um, I start having a lot of classes. I want to start splitting them up into packages. So by default, everything is put inside of your default package. If you wanted to um, put stuff outside of that, you would first have to make another package that's not the default package, which after introductory courses, this is usually what you do. Um, and this first package is usually named after like your group or something like that, an organization. Um, for the most part, it's usually something like the website organization name, like org. Um, polis.team1 or something like that if you were taking softench. Um, so actually I'll do that. So um, one of the big things in Eclipse is if you don't know what you're trying to do, but you know you want to do something somewhere, when in doubt, right click. Pretty much the right click menu has almost everything you'll ever need and uh, it tries to give you the options that would make sense for that context. So like I clicked, right clicked on the source folder and I wanted to make a new package inside of that source folder so that was one of the options already there. So I created that. Currently there's nothing in it. Um, I'm going to start moving some code around here. Um, so let me say the first thing we did was we want to separate out, um, uh, let's see, uh, so we source code. Let's say I want to separate out the fruit classes from my examples. Um, so when you create two uh, packages here, this is the default display for Eclipse. You have org polis team, org polis team fruit. Technically this guy is, uh, as far as the hierarchy goes, is actually inside of this package. It's kind of weird to look at it this way, at least in my uh, view. So what you can do is go up to the package explorer drop down area here in the view menu and one of your options should be package presentation. Right now it's flat, which means it doesn't do anything. Hierarchical sorts it, so it's a little bit easier on the eyes. So when you do that, um, yeah, since uh, there was nothing in org uh, polis team, and except for the fruit package, it just smashed them into one. So let's first move the examples class into our new package for our soft end project. So I right clicked on it, because that's usually what I do. Um, refactor, because I'm changing something. Refactor is usually the menu that you do to change <laughs> stuff. And in here, um, you know, I don't want to rename the file, but I do want to move it. So I get this, and it's like, okay, where the heck do you want to put this file? Well, it's an examples class, so let me just put it in the root directory of my new package. And it goes in there, and now it's in there. Um, so we actually have some interesting stuff going on, but let me first start moving over the fruit classes. I will select all of them using uh, shift click and right click, refactor, move, and I'll bring them over into the fruit package. Um, it may yell at you because it's trying to stop you from refactoring code and causing more problems. You can usually just continue anyway. Um, and also, I'm actually going to move the main outside of fruit because that really should be in the root of your project here. All right, so it actually stopped yelling at me. Now, you were asking about private and public and stuff like that. I'm going to bring this up. It's not really going to be pertinent for your class because you may not even touch packages, but for the soft edge guys, this is going to be really important because... They do packages late in the term. They do? Late in the term? Late in the term. made them at it. Okay, well, you guys should start using packages now. That's at least yeah. my opinion. Um, so technically, every package has scope. So let's say we have a public class Apple. In your class, um, since everything is really just in the source directory folder, we don't have like these sub packages going on. Um, you guys just have class Apple. And that starts causing problems. So if you notice, um, you know, example starts getting mad. You know, so if I'm in banana here um, and I go to this and I do um, say new. Apple, uh, Banana still knows about Apple, and that's because the scope of Apple right now is default, which means uh, the default um, scope for any class is package private, 
which means that the only the things inside of the fruit package know about Apple. You can start making some really good design decisions there, so while you guys are splitting up code for your soft edge group, if there's things that, you know, you have, I don't know, let's say you have your main application interface, and uh, you've got controllers, and you've got like your model going on, if like you have something that shows, displays a screen of things, and there's some other class that it should never know about ever, you could move that into another package and make it not public. So that starts kind of separating out code and how other code can see other classes. And that's something that can get really complex, but it's something um, that we'll be going over in that class and is something that with conjunction of your TA during your meetings, you may be able to make some uh, good choices for organizing your code and uh, helping to make sure that you don't step on each other's toes. Um, so that's really uh, a very quick, like, in a nutshell explanation of how packages work and how scope works. For the most part, um, public is fine. Uh, I do not think until you guys cover scope in 2102 that you will have to worry about um, the scope of your classes. As long as it's you know public or not public, it's perfectly fine. So you can write it with public in front or without public in front? Like yeah. The only time it would cause problems is like in this case, examples doesn't can't know about Apple because it's not visible. Yeah, because I didn't put public and it's in a different package. If you don't use packages in 2102, none of these issues will ever come into play. So if you don't want to deal with that complexity, just put everything inside of the default package. But that is something that you will cover later on in your career at WPI. Okay, so that covers packages and scope. Were there any other questions before I start getting into, uh, let me see, I'll, I'll go into the tester stuff after this because I know that's a big point for all of you uh, 2102 guys. Yes? Yeah. Um, what is the Why do we want to do that? So different panes is in different files? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So in Dr. Java, a lot of you guys may just have something like homework1.java or lab1.java, and you put all of your class files one after another in there. One big annoying thing that you may guys may have seen is uh, if you guys reference a class, let's say uh, your examples class referenced Apple, and Apple was defined after the Your Examples class, you get compilation errors. Oh, because Yeah. Yep. So in this case, when you put everything in different files, it deals with that problem for you, so you can keep things separate. And really, it's kind of nice to only have one class, one object, and one file, because you know a text file is kind of like an object here, and that's what you're defining. Mm -hmm. So I believe in Eclipse, I don't think it actually even allows you to. I can no, try this. Yeah. yeah. So if you try putting two classes in one file here, uh, let's say I have uh, Apple, and let's say I wanted to put that into my examples class for direct access. Try the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Public type Apple must be defined in some file. The rule is the source file can only have one public class <coughs> in it, and that has to have the same name as the file. Yeah. So for your purposes, um, the thing in Eclipse is, is yes, you do have to make separate files for separate classes, but yeah, it's, yep. it's a Java rule, and um, Dr. Java technically ignores it by doing some compilation stuff that's pretty interesting. Do you always want the name of a file to the same class? Usually. It's a good standard to follow. And, yeah, and I mean, what it eventually gets you to do here is when you're editing these files that are now, all these classes that are in different files, they all show up on their different tabs. So you can kind of keep your, your uh, organization nice and separate as far as that goes. Um, did you have any further questions with that? Okay. Um, yes? Debugging perspective. Um, yeah, let me get into the tester for the 2102 guys because that's pretty much the last thing they'll need to at least be able to write code in Eclipse. And uh, I know the debugger is something that, especially for soft edge guys, you're going to need to sit there for a while. <laughs> um, so, tester, debugger, yes? Can you talk about Git later too? I will try to fit time in for that. Um, that's there's another event. There is another event? I think so. Probably. Okay. So we're going to try to make that another event. Um, I believe uh, Git on their website somewhere, or Git for Eclipse, has this really nice one-page intro on uh, setting up the plugin yeah. and um, you know using it. And it's pre-installed in Eclipse, so you just have to open up that perspective, right-click, and mess around a little bit, and that should be able to help you figure it out. And uh, 
for your projects, you can host them either on your own public Git account or Fusion Forge. Um, any other questions before I go on? Yes. Uh, I'm like Eclipse is not running on my computer at the same time as John Barr and Simon Barr. Yeah. So we had uh, somebody come up to us at the beginning of this with that same issue. It's just that Java is not installed on your computer. If Eclipse can't find it, so we will try to help you debug that after the lecture if we have time. Uh, yes. Um, I can make the files available. Um, I am recording this right now, so this video will also be available if we were going too fast on some sections. I will try to include the file as a link as well. Um, all right, so for you 2102 guys, uh, let's just get the tester jar going because that's something I shouldn't need to do. So I have it pre-set up in this project because I wrote a test case using tester. Let's assume that that's not what's been set up, so I'm going to get rid of the tester jar. Or Oh, was that there? Yep, right there. Remove. Yes. Build path, remove. Build path. Ah, thank you. Move. I can't see. There we go. All right, so now tester doesn't exist. So what you guys need to do first is um, how the um, basic setup goes is you need to get that main.java file. So if you download that file and put it into your project directory, um, so if you downloaded the file, went into where your workspace was, um, went into your example project, okay, because I added the packages. Um, in the root of your project, you'll probably see something like this. You want to download that main.java that's with the instruction file, and you're going to drop that in here, um, which is the root of your project directory, which is probably where your examples class will be and where all your other classes will be. So once that's copied over, if you rerun Eclipse, you may have to refresh the project. You can do that easily again by right-clicking, going to refresh, or doing the standard web browser F5, and the main.java should pop up. So in the main.java, um, you know, if you guys um, copy the one that she had, it should be importing tester. Right now, um, it doesn't know what tester is, and that's because the jar file doesn't exist. It's not a part of the build path for this project, so it has no idea what you're talking about. So we need to resolve that first. And the way you do that is actually pretty simple in Eclipse here. So if you right click on the project, go to the build path option, and your build path is kind of uh, what your additional libraries are. Um, so your build path is where um, if you have some external resource, like a jar file, like another project or something like that, and you need to use that within your project, this is how you link the two things together. So in this case, this would be the jar file. So you also need to download the jar file and put it somewhere in a safe place so your project can find it. Um, usually somewhere in the workspace is perfectly fine. So at this point, you'd have to go here to add external archives, because uh, just like in Dr. Java, I believe this is very similar to how they name the external libraries thing. It's pretty much the same name. So we're doing pretty much the same thing that you would do in Dr. Java. And for me, I put it inside of my workspace folder in a folder called lib. You can put it wherever you want, just make sure that it's not going to get deleted or moved. I select the tester.jar and open it, and it is automatically added to my external libraries. So now my project knows about the tester jar. It knows about the um, actual tester package. So it can resolve this import here. And that import should already be there in the main file. Now, at this point, um, you guys need to write an examples class. So let's say this examples class didn't exist. Um, so right now, you know, it doesn't know what an examples class is. So let's start with a fresh examples class. Let's assume that we had nothing in here. So just like the uh, just like the tutorial um, told you to, um, you'll have to import the tester jar. So the name of the tester jar is just tester. And when you do dot, there's technically a bunch of stuff in here. For ease of use, if you do dot star, that just means import the whole thing. You know, technically that's a waste of space, but for you guys who just want to get it to work, so this is how you can do it. And uh, then in your examples class, um, you know, you need to add the constructor here and then you need to write some sort of test case according to the uh, example that you guys gave you in class. And uh, 
pretty much um, it just needs to take in a test or T, which it'll get passed from the main function, and you'll do a T check expect. And once that's set up, um, see, is the other guy's screen? It doesn't know what an apple is. Oh, yeah. It's just got modifier. Yeah. Don't worry about that. You guys won't get that. That was because I did the whole package thing. Um, so at this point, um, everything, your examples class and your main class now knows about your tester jar. So at this point, your code is compiling. So now we want to run it and run our tests. Again, um, you can technically do it up here. I usually just like right-clicking because that's usually where I find most of the things I need to do in here. And I want to go to run as, and I want to go to Java application. Now, you'll get this big nasty thing and be like, all right, what the heck am I supposed to run here? So what you want to be able to run is uh, you guys wrote a main function, um, that main.java that you put inside of your project that had a main function in it. That's what you want to run. So you should see something like this in the list, or if you just search for main, um, you guys will probably have this come up as main, and then this is the location. You'll probably just have like default package or something like that. And once you click on that saying, OK, I want to run this main function that is in main.java in my project, and press OK. Um, it just wants it to save files. That's fine. You will then have it run, and it will output to the console. And my test case failed, probably because I messed up something while I was moving code around, and you could debug that. So that is at least um, getting through the tester jar. Um, and as far as error messages go for you guys, uh, especially in 2102, um, Dr. Java, how you would normally do is you would write your code, press compile, and then at the bottom of the screen you would get a bunch of listing of error codes, and you'd have to try to piece through them, try to figure out what they mean. They may be a little nebulous or convoluted, and that can be a little tiresome. What Eclipse does is all of your errors that you could possibly cause as far as compilation goes will be highlighted exactly where they should be. So, I don't know, let's say this was something like this. Um, you know, I don't have to compile this file myself and look at some sort of output at the bottom here. I can get the information directly where the problem is. And if I scroll over it, it will give me information on what the issue is. NumC cannot be resolved to a variable. So this is kind of like the error that you would see at the bottom of Dr. Java. And it will also try to recommend quick fixes available for maybe you made a typo, maybe you need to create a field in here. And you know, one of the options will usually be pertinent to you, or at least it will tell you exactly what the problem is. In this case, oh, it's not num seed, it's num seeds. I change that, the error is gone. This is uh, really a great piece of functionality, especially with the autocomplete. Um, it'll make it a lot easier to write code, and you'll know instantly that you wrote something wrong, you made a typo. So you can kind of write your code and be assured that it at least compiles. You may have test cases not working, but you don't have to worry about um, let's say specifically running it, getting like 100 error messages, and then just having to pick through your files and figure out what the heck is going on with your classes. You get all that information and feedback immediately. Um, so I guess at that point, are there any more questions on 2102 material before I start um, just quickly going over the debugger and also Git if I have time? Um, do you have to import that tester every time you make a new project or what have you? Yeah, so it has to be a part of the build path of the project. So, I mean, it's literally two clicks. No, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, you do. Because every project kind of has its own idea of, like, what files do I know about? What external libraries do I know about? So you just need to tell every project, hey, you want this. Do you need to make something called the .java for every project? Yeah, so what main.java is, is you just call it that because it's a good name because it's a class main. Oh, it just has to Yeah. So what this is here, um, this is actually what runs when you call run as and then you run this class, is it looks, what Java actually looks for is this uh, public static void main method. And all it does in your guys' case, and this is probably what you'll do for the first four weeks or so, is it runs your tester cases okay. for all the examples class. But you can put it in any file name. It doesn't have to be called no, but usually um, the best standard is your class name should also be the name of the file. It just keeps things um, easy. So if this was called like class main and then this file was called banana, I would start getting really confused. Oh, I see. The class yeah. Is yeah. So really you have one class per file, so why not call the file by the name of its class? Um, any more questions pertinent to 2102 and getting you guys started with Eclipse? Okay, so I had somebody who was interested in the debugging perspective. Was there anything else I put off that you guys wanted to hear about? How do you combine the C and C++ 
That's a fun one. I don't know <laughs> if the plugin is still f running around. Um, I believe it is. So technically, the C C++ plugin is just a perspective. Um, I actually had a student come to me who had that pre-installed. What I highly recommend just to keep things working, because it can get pretty messy with all these plugins, is just have two separates of Eclipse on your computer. If you wanted to try doing that, I would number one look it up because I'm not familiar with splicing together two versions of Eclipse. Um, check number one, is there a plugin? Um, so if you just look for it, you should be able to hopefully download a separate plugin and throw that in your plugins folder. And it sh should go through a nice tutorial for that. Or what you could technically do is maybe take all the plugins from the C, C++ version and move them over. But again, you're kind of doing some Frankenstein stuff there, so I would look for a separate plugin specifically. And also, for RB2002, you have to do open now in Eclipse? You guys have to do debug? Or Arduino in Eclipse. Arduino in Eclipse. Um, so that's not something we're going to cover in here, unfortunately. Yeah, we have to do a C, C++ plugin. Okay, so yes. when I first I, came I up here, tell them a bit yeah, I mean, if you guys need to do C, C++ development in Eclipse, um, you guys can grab this version of Eclipse. Mm -hmm. That's for C and C++ developers that should get you guys going with that. As for the actual Arduino stuff, it's a little more complicated to actually run your code. I think you still need Arduino to use it, the Arduino ID to actually do the execution. Um, they should be able to tell you a little bit about that more. I know people have done it, I've just never done it myself. Okay. Alright, so I guess I'll go over the debugger. Um, any of you 2102 guys, um, it's a little complicated, but it does allow you to go through your code step by step, so it is something that's pretty important. It's just a little bit more complex than just using it for the first homework assignment. So, actually I'll use this example right now because I actually have a test case failing, so I can actually debug why this is happening. So in here, uh, it expects the actual value of the number of seeds is zero, and it expects three. All right, so something weird is going on. Um, so my examples class, if I make that bigger here, I have the expected number of seeds, and then I pass that into the constructor, and then I call getNum seeds, and you know I would expect that these should be the same value. So let me go take a look at getNum seeds here. So I'm going to control click on it. That's our uh, shortcut for going to a declaration, which is pretty nice. It just bounced me over there. So, oh yeah. So it's pretty simple because this is a very simple code. You can actually tell, okay, I returned zero because I never actually implemented this method. But let's assume this was more complicated. Um, let me try to make this a couple lines here just for interestingness. So let's say uh, I'm going to do something really stupid here. Um, so you would never do something like this, but <laughs> just uh, to get. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. So you never do something like this, but let's assume that's what it was. So the first thing you need to do in order to debug your code is to set breakpoints. As in, okay, when I'm running my test, when I'm running my code, where is it going to stop so I can start taking a closer look? And uh, you can actually do that pretty easily with the clips. So on here on the side is your line numbers and things like that. Um, on the right side, you would get error messages and stuff like that if you wanted to jump to it. But unless they haven't changed anything, I should be able to... Yeah, toggle breakpoints. So if you just double click over here, you can toggle breakpoints for each line of code. Um, so let's say I wanted to start looking at this uh, for loop here. I can add a breakpoint there. And just need to save that file because I added the for loop. And let me get out of that perspective. And if I remember correctly, let's do this. Debug as Java application. So this is what it's going to do is not only run the main function, which will then run the test, it'll also look for breakpoints and stop if it finds one. So I'm going to run that. Okay, for some reason when you debug, it wants to access your home network connection. It, it must do local network. That's really cool. Okay, so this kind of launch configured is open debug perspective when it suspends when it hits a breakpoint. It does all the work for you. It's just kind of telling you, you know, do you want to open this perspective now? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, so it hit that line and it broke. And by broke, not like broken into pieces, but stopped. So 
at this point, um, this is your debug perspective. This is a little bit more of a higher level perspective than just writing code. In here, you're just doing debugging, completely separate. You could switch back and forth from here to here, up in your perspectives pane. Um, so what's nice about this is it can tell you a lot about your variables, what breakpoints you have, and where they are. And uh, you can actually get the value. So like numseeds is 3. Edit 1. Huh? Edit it. Show me how to change it. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. So um, because you set a breakpoint, you can actually change values on the fly while it's running. So if I wanted to, I could you know change this to 0 or something like that. Um, let's keep it as 3 just for right now. And also, as you'll notice, um, the test case actually prints out the results. So right now, it printed out the header for the uh, tester jar, and it's waiting to print out the results because it's waiting for this test case to finish. And really, the most interesting thing you'll have here is uh, in this window, this is where you'll see your code. And how you kind of step through this code is using the stepper options above. So you have pretty much three of these that are important. So step into, which means it'll go as deep as possible. So let's say. Um, I put a breakpoint at a function call. If I do step into, it'll step into that function call. It'll step into that for loop. You can also do step over, which means, all right, I just kind of want to skip over this. I'm not really concerned about this. You know, this isn't what I need to start looking at in very fine detail. So I'm just going to look over that, you know, not actually go into all the inner workings and just get it to return whatever value, set whatever it needs to do. And also step return, which will step until it hits a return statement. Yeah, it'll basically it'll step out of the function that you're in and go yeah. to a place where it returned. Yeah. So if you step into it. and you want to kind of step out again, you can just do a step return, which will bring you right back there. So in here, let me just step into. It'll step into the for loop, which doesn't do anything. So it got, it optimized your for loop. Oh, uh, did it optimize it? Well, yeah, yeah, it did actually. So yeah, I got equal to four here. So uh, yeah, it since there was nothing happening in the for loop, it just decided to skip over it because there's nothing to step into. But uh, let me stop and re-debug this. So the debug tool up here is right there. So just get right back to that. So right now, i doesn't exist, um, or i isn't set to any value. It gets set to i equals 0 in here, and then it runs the for loop. Um, and then when I step into it, you'll see that your variables up here change. And at this point, where it stopped its code, which is at the return i, um, I equals 4. This is a little bit more interesting if I did something. Uh, let me make this a little bit more interesting for you guys. So, I don't know what you redefine that. Uh, problem. Your shadow Oh, fine. I'll call it. So let me just rerun the debugger here since I changed the code. So it stopped here again. Um, so right now numseeds is 3, which is the attribute of the class. Um, you know, color and stuff like that. This is and this is the Apple class. So right now numseeds is 3. Let's uh, step into this. So we just had a change there. So return value got set to 0. And if I step into again, which should hopefully now step into the for loop and won't optimize it, I got set to zero. I'm at the first iteration of this for loop, and return value is zero. So now it's going to increment return value, which it did, and it went back up to the top of the for loop, um, which it will then increment i, which it did. And you can keep going through that, just kind of see how your code goes through step by step. So if you have some really complicated logic process, you can kind of just do it one by one, be like, kind of think about it yourself, like, okay, it should do this first, and then it should be this. And you can see where you tripped up pretty well, because right now return value just went to 4, and i is 4. So I'm returning 4 instead of 3. All right, so I went 1 too many times. Oh, it's because of that. I can make that change. And uh, then when I run my code, the test actually passes. And that's pretty much how your use of the debug should work. I'd say look at the test cases that fail or what's failing. Go to open that declaration, figure out where you want to stop within there, and then step through that uh, in whatever detail you need for that case. Yes? Is there a way to step backwards? Uh, call stack. Call stack? Call stack. Oh, yeah. So just click on a, an entry in the call stack and you'll get back. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah. let me rerun the debugger here. 
And let me step over this and step over that. Step over that. Okay. So it actually doesn't step over four loops. Alright, so in the call stack here. Basically, you can be like, how did I get here? Yeah, so. You can't actually step backwards because of the loss of physics. No, but you, you can examine the state that brought you to your current position. So if you're inside a function, you can you can look up the call stack and see what function called your function, and, and keep going back like that, and examine the state of all the all the variables and everything else that was at that state in the call stack. Yeah, looking. Right. You could step. You could go back to main if you want. Yeah. So where it's kind of where it is now is uh. Oh, some of them are dead. Yeah, some of them are dead. Because technically shows all the threads here, but that's where we were as far as that goes. So we step back to the start of getting seeds before um, we start stepping through it. And if you kept going, it started adding stuff to this because it's just invoking methods. It's not really making any function calls. Um, and if I wanted to, I could step backwards to getting up seeds, which would bring them back to there. Any other questions on that? Is there anything I didn't cover that you guys would like to hear about in the last couple of minutes or so? Um, for those that are still here, I know a lot of people left. Do you guys feel a little bit more comfortable with Eclipse starting out? And uh, I will make sure to have, um, we're going to see where we can host these videos and also where we can host the files. And hopefully you guys will get an email exactly where stuff is linked. Um, so you can watch the video over again if you want to slow down in some parts if we skipped quickly on how we were doing shortcuts and things like that. Um, or if you just want a refresher. And uh, I'll also just have these classes up so you guys in 2102 can kind of look at a... Um, example project that doesn't really do much but at least you know how classes are made and how they look like and you know just browse through it and figure out how the tester jar is run and stuff like that all right um any other questions all right thank you ever so much for attending our first upe event um those two people if you are still here that were having troubles with the jre um we can take a look down here for you thank you <laughs>